And it's the final class of Wisdom of Wilderness. Ooh, let me get this out of the way. Take it away, Jake. All right. So welcome, uh, Hearthstone residents, <laughs> to the final installation of the Wild Wisdom for Wilderness crusade that we have been on. Um, I'm in a Billy Graham mode right now. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so Wisdom for Wilderness. And uh, we're going to finish a bit early, so then I am going to actually read you something from one of my books just uh, to kind of give you your money's worth uh, to make sure we get all the way through. So, um, But uh, let's see here. We ended off at the bottom of page 174. So I'll just start off uh, in the middle of 174 just to recap a little bit, and then we'll this will take us all the way to the end of the book. So, um, and the book is, let's see, to 188. So we got about 14 pages. So the middle of 174. Then I got permission from the owners to camp in the precious place of fields and meadows where the giant matriarch tree lives where I saw the little deer that was completely fear, where I found the turtle shell, and where I had so carefully measured the movements of the sun through the seasons. I built a lean-to and a fire pit there and spent many lovely hours at that place, but for some reason it never worked out for me to camp there overnight. I also went for more frequent day trips in my canoe they were sweet and refreshing. But with all these attempts, I never again felt the power of the slowing come into me and guide me with the strength she had in the mountain forest. By the summer of 1994, even the mountain itself felt different. I drove to Green Ridge in June and to my shameful resentment found that many other people had discovered its joys. Only a few years earlier, almost no one had camped there in summertime. But now the place seemed crowded and I had to search for a site that promised even a little solitude. I finally found one, but on the second day, a Boy Scout troop pulled in and set up camp a quarter of a mile down the hill. I was honestly happy that others were sharing this place, but I could not avoid a small proprietary anger. It was my place and I wanted to keep it for myself. And there too, even before the scouts came, power of the slowing failed to appear. Intellectually, I understood and I still understand today that the power of the slowing will always be completely wild and free. She shows up when and where and how she chooses according to the divine wisdom that she is. It was never my place to determine her actions, only to respond to her invitations. I also understood that in reality, she is everywhere always, but that was no consolation for I no longer could sense her palpable presence, the feel of her guiding my steps. I missed her terribly, but there was nothing I could do. So um, uh, the, the mystics of various religions call this the desert. Um, and it's not just Judaism or Christianity, but Sufism, Islam, Vedanta, Hinduism, the different mystics call this, like when you feel really close to God, um, they call that the mystical presence. But when it, when it leaves, um, you feel like you're going through this desert by yourself, even though, like he's saying, that divine presence is always there. Um, when you don't feel it so acutely, um, that stage the mystics refer to as being in the desert. And that's the real test of the, of the spiritual person, whether they can stay on the path, even when they're not being inundated with, with the presence and, but yet still know that it's there. Very gradually, I began to notice something I had been previously unwilling to admit. I no longer heard the call of the wilderness my yearning to be alone out there had disappeared. The time of the power of the slowing had ended. One day in February of 1995, it struck me that I should go to the forested mountain just once more, not alone, but with Earl, my oldest son. I didn't question the feeling or make anything of it. I simply called and asked if he'd like to do it. 
the idea hit him as a godsend, something he really needed right then. The timing was perfect. So in the snowfall of a winter Friday, we packed our gear and bought food for monster meals and went there. The first time I'd gone with anyone else, and it was indeed perfect. There were no miraculous visitations from a palpable power of the slowing. But by then I had given up hope for such manifestations and was hoping only for what would be. We sat for hours and watched the fire and snowflakes that the wind blew horizontally across the mountain. We were very happy. By early spring, I had finally admitted to myself that I no longer felt the call to solitude on my forested mountain. I still went frequently to sit and walk in the place of fields and meadows, and often on a weekend, I spent the better part of a day in my canoe. But these were no longer seeking, searching, yearning times. They were simply times of seeing, feeling, experiencing what was there. There was much expectancy in me, but no expectations. On one of those canoeing excursions, I was healed of my addiction to fishing. It was the first really warm day of 1995, and I brought my fishing tackle and purchased a dozen fresh fat night crawlers. I put the canoe in at the boat launch near where the Franklin trees grow and paddled without a thought to a likely spot near the opposite shore where I dropped the anchor. Most people fish for crappy at that time of year, and they're there in abundance. I caught and released a couple of them, thrilled by the bites, but somehow sure catfish also lurked nearby. Then I sat with my bait on the bottom, my mind wholly empty in the springtime sky and water, and I felt the rod move in my hand. It was neither a nibble nor a strike, just a movement. I watched the line where it entered the calm water and it moved, gliding steadily away from the shore, away from the canoe, away from me. I set the hook and the line went taut and the drag on my reel whined and the canoe itself moved with the pull out and away until the anchor line reached its limit. Concerned that the fish, and I knew it was a catfish, would break the line, I stretched my left hand out with the rod toward the fish and at the same time pulled on the anchor with my right. As soon as the anchor broke bottom, I felt the canoe move toward the fish. He was pulling the canoe, actually moving it, even while the anchor was still in the water. I got the anchor aboard by pulling the rope, grabbing it in my teeth, pulling again, and all the while the canoe was accelerating toward the middle of the reservoir, pulled by this calm, wonderful fish. He took me for a ride around the reservoir and other fishermen on the shore saw it happening and pointed. This time I took no particular pleasure in their attention. I was absorbed by the pure fun of being towed by this fish I had hooked. The fish finally tired, and I was able to bring him to the side of the canoe. He, or maybe she, as I saw the stomach bulging, perhaps with eggs, was huge. Far too big for the little net I carry in the canoe. So I grabbed a piece of the loose anchor line and passed it through her gill slit, up through her mouth, and tied her to the canoe. Oh, oh my God. I immediately paddled back the flames of fishing addiction burning high to the place where I had caught her and mindlessly put another worm on the hook and cast back into the same spot. Almost immediately, it happened again. Another huge catfish took the bait and took me for a ride, and again I secured it with a piece of anchor line. Back again to the same spot. Only this time, no bites. After half an hour again, without thinking about it, I paddled back to the boat launch. I got my camera and photographed the two fish and then released them without a single thought of broiling catfish steaks. I loaded up the canoe and drove home. The next time I went out in the canoe, I simply forgot to take fishing tackle. 
Somehow and finally landing the big catfish of my dreams, my compulsion to catch fish was gone. And it has not returned to this day. Since I cannot walk very far these days, I have a little electric mobility scooter to help me get around. Last spring, I rode the scooter down a path to a lake not far from our house. I tossed a line in just to see what it was like. Immediately, a nice bass took the hook and still sitting in the scooter, I reeled him in. He was really a beautiful specimen, close to four pounds with exquisite coloration. And as I released him, I realized that this had been the first fishing I'd done in well over a year. It was fun but I felt no pull to put the line back into the water. Somehow after those catfish towed my canoe in early 1995, I was delivered from an addiction that had had me irrevocably hooked. Now with great gratitude, I can declare that I am free. And I believe this is the last section called Great Gratitude. I've written a book about addiction and people expect me to be an expert on the subject, but I'll never really understand how such deliverances happen. The healing of my fishing addiction is no exception. All I can say is thank you. I didn't realize it at the beginning, but it was gratitude that was replacing my longing for the wilderness and for the touch of the power of the slow. Gratitude was slowly filling my heart. And it was more than being thankful from, for freedom from an addiction. It was eventually to become the great gratitude. Sheer, unspecified thanksgiving for absolutely everything. At first, I didn't identify it as gratitude. It felt like a growing sense of happiness within me. Sometime in the late spring of 1995, a friend casually asked me if I was happy. I wanted to respond with an absolute yes, but I held it back. Always before I would have equivocated. I would have said I was happy about some things and sad about others. Now I found myself wanting to say I was truly, completely happy. It felt very strange to me, even absurd. How could such complete happiness be authentic when there was so much suffering in the world? Even when I'd just been to Bosnia, where so many atrocities were being committed. Yet I felt I had to acknowledge the truth of how I was feeling. I said it aloud as much to myself as to my friend. Yes, I am happy. For the first time in my life, I can say I am completely happy. It was a shock to hear myself say the words. For days afterward, I reflected on the feeling, re-examining it, trying to find some fault in it. I wondered if it were another midlife phenomenon finally and abysmally attributable to hormones. <laughs> I wondered if I were going crazy, but always the feeling remained that deep down happiness and thanksgiving is steady and absolute as bedrock without reason or excuse, completely without justification. From day to day, week to week, Happiness deepened within me. As I came to know it better and grew more accepting of it, I began to call it joy. The thought even came to me. I feel so complete, so fulfilled, so grateful for everything. I wonder if perhaps I am going to die soon. During the first week in May, I discovered a lump in my testicle. I went through a day of denial and then a week of fear before I saw the urologist. Through it all, the gratitude never left me, nor did it even diminish. 
I completely gave up trying to understand, much less explain it. The gratitude remained through the surgery of having the testicle removed, through the diagnosis of lymphoma, through the strange discovery of another kind of lymphoma in my bone marrow, through seemingly endless painful tests, and through the six months of chemotherapy that were to follow. This was a new wilderness into which I was called. And the story of it is too long to recount here. I can say though that the joy and gratitude remained with me when knowing that the chemotherapy would soon make me too weak to use my canoe, I sadly put her away in midsummer, long before she expected it. And through the countless times I sobbed to think how long it would be before she and I might again move together on emptiness and miss. The joy and gratitude were also with me as in my last week of physical strength, I closed down my lean-to, the one in which I had never slept, dug up the gear I had buried there and cried and dug the hole even deeper and laid myself down in it with a pure desire to be in the earth for her healing and out of sheer thanksgiving for all she had taught me about myself. What it means to be humble, humane, human, humus, humorous, earth herself. The chemotherapy made me far too weak even to consider going back to the forested mountain. But I also found I had no special desire to return. That particular call was gone for me. But my youngest son, Ray, has been there overnight and alone in the very place where I first went. Greg is a professional clown. Exhausted after a long tour with the circus and wanting to be near the rest of the family as I went through my treatments, he returned home in midsummer. I need some quiet, he said, and I've been thinking about that place where you camp in the mountains. I've just been wondering about going there myself for a couple of days. I thought maybe you could tell me about it, you know, how to get there and stuff. I can't communicate the joy I felt as I gave him directions to the site and shared my fatherly wisdom about what to take, nor the excitement I felt for him while he was there nor my ecstasy when he returned, healed and dirty and smelling of fire smoke with peacefulness in his eyes. I made him tell me every detail of his experience. He said, among other things, that he had sat for hours by the fire, thinking of nothing. The power of the slowing has never come to me again at least not in the form in which I met her on the mountain. And I don't expect her ever again to appear like that. But there has continued to be a divine presence that has accompanied my journeys during the past 10 years. Every living thing changes and grows. And as I have changed and grown, so has this force of nature, this power of the slowing, it has no gender now, nor has it ever physically touched or moved me as she did. But it has taught and guided me in ways far too delicate to describe. Many of which are so intimate, they do not even filter through my ego and my will. It has not all been pleasant to be sure. I have suffered much and my family and friends with me. First, there was the chemotherapy, which nearly killed me twice. There was a time during that particular treatment when I lost touch with both the sense of gratitude and the sense of presence. It happened at a time of full incapacitation when I had the strength to do nothing but lie in bed when it seemed I would stay that way for over a month. Then I felt neither joy nor gratitude. 
nor any guiding presence. Mm -hmm. The only presence I felt then was my own and a slight glimmering wisdom knowing that presence is presence. My own being is continually created within God's being. It occurred to me then that maybe sometimes when we feel most alone and abandoned by the divine, it is because that one is so very close to us that we can no longer make the distinction. The sense of presence returned soon enough and I began a long journey of recovery though I never felt really healthy again, not like I used to. I tried to chalk it up to getting older, but then in the summer of 2002, I discovered I had congestive heart failure. A biopsy showed the cause, a form of cardiomyopathy, so rare that it does not even have incidence figures in the United States. It's slightly more common in the tropics and especially in children in Nigeria and Uganda. Why me? I don't have a clue. There is no known cause and no known treatment. All the cardiologists could do was manage my heart failure symptoms and evaluate me for a heart transplant. I waited for a year and a half on the transplant list at Johns Hopkins. Then I began to collect fluid around my tight, my right lung, and a routine examination revealed that it contained lymphoma cells. So a transplant is no longer an option, and I'm beginning another round of chemotherapy. My heart is so weak that the same kind of treatment I had 10 years ago would surely kill me. Still, they have found a milder approach that we hope will work. Nor has the suffering only been related to my illnesses. Years ago, our daughter fell into drug addiction and never really recovered. As is so often true with serious addictions, it is impossible to count how many times we got our hopes up for her and how many times those hopes were dashed. She's in her thirties now and we've had no word from her for over a year. I only got to walk in the woods alone with her once. I was, I thought, recovering from my first chemotherapy, and she was just out of a drug rehab center, doing her best at her own recovery. It was winter, and it was a delight for both of us to walk together in the snow. There wasn't any sense of the power of the slowing. I've realized I need to be alone for that but I treasure the memory of walking with my daughter in the snow. Betty and I often look at each other and shake our heads in amazement. What a roller coaster these past 20 years have been. I am overwhelmed when I think of the steady love with which she has gone through these years with me and how our kids have loved us through their own pain and how our friends have shared the depths with us and how hundreds, perhaps thousands of people have prayed for us through those years. Of course, we've had our good times as well. Tons of lovely laughter together, beautiful family times, gratitude and pride for our kids and grandkids. The little canoe went to Florida with Paul because I could no longer handle it. He sent me pictures of his daughters muffled in life preservers, paddling the canoe on warm Floridian waters. This past June, he also sent me a framed photograph of his youngest daughter sitting by a campfire. Around the photo, he had written a poem, at peace. Barely dawn, the frogs and crickets wake me, cold in my sleeping bag. I hold my tent flat back and see him squatting next to the fire. His old hat with a new feather, simple boots, rawhide laces, his pipe smoke mixes with the campfires, then carries the scent of bacon into my tent. It's cold. I have to pee, but I watch him 
just sitting there, his arms across his knees, watching the fire, the bacon sizzles, he is at peace. Later, I feel his strong fingers around my waist. The rock ledge is inches from my toes. Autumn painted treetops blanket the world below us. I'm afraid, but safe, breathless. Over moonlit sand dunes on Lake Superior, he floats a frisbee with perfect aim. We play for hours past midnight. The moon is bright and we cannot stop laughing. Late that night, I hear his voice strangely serious. Be very still, he says. A skunk wanders past the front of our tents. We are terrified, thrilled, silent. I remember these things because my little girl is curled up in my arms. I smell the campfire smoke in her hair, her fingers sticky with marshmallows. It is cold and I hold her close to keep her warm. The frogs and crickets will wake me first. Maybe she will watch me, watch the fire. I will be at peace. All our May, June, 2004. When the power of the slowing first called me into the wild, I had a misty background feeling that I was being prepared for something. Those five years from 1990 to 1995 healed a deep fracture in me and taught me how to live my own nature. They changed me in ways I could not fathom at the time. Only in retrospect do I see that they were indeed a kind of prep school, getting me ready for an ever deepening education in nature an ongoing trek through a wilderness that in truth has no end. As I said at the beginning, wilderness is not just a place like the outdoors or one's own body or mind. It is also a way of being, being wilder. And as such, it is endless wilderness is eternal and in truth wilderness is everywhere you don't have to go tromping to the mountains or desert as i did you may find it in a local park an open field or a small woods as i have said you may even find it in your own room or in your own body and mind all it takes is listening for wisdom's call. Regardless of how, where, or when you experience it, wilderness changes you. You come out of it a deeper, wilder, more natural you. I think, for example, of how wilderness changed my attitude toward cancer. Before my times in outdoor solitude, I probably would have accepted the general cultural reaction to cancer and other life-threatening illnesses, which is to see them as enemies. During my first chemotherapy, I was struck by how many of my fellow patients spoke of fighting their cancers. Sometimes people referred to me as battle cancer. I think it was wholly my experience of the wild that made such warlike references feel wrong for me. Instead, I had to include my cancer cells in the natural isness of things just as they are. The lymphoma cells are also just what they are, deformed perhaps, misguided for sure, wounded in ways that make them destructive, but in no way enemies. Now, when I think of my cancer cells, I recall the time in the snow when I looked where the pileated woodpecker looked and saw the perfection of trees, each of which was in its own way deformed, scarred, misshapen, even rotting. So the deformed lymphocytes that wander through my body cannot be enemies. I do not hate them. 
neither do I concoct some silly tree hugging love for them. Like all other things in true nature, they simply are what they are. This has had implications for my attitude toward treatment as well. The civilized world around me, including the medical world, expects me to participate in strategies for management of my illness. Civilization looks for causes and explanations to form an understanding of the illness, which is the necessary first step toward devising an appropriate management strategy. It's very much like conducting warfare. Understanding the enemy is a prerequisite for victorious strategies and tactics of battle. I have no objection to such attitudes when they work. And quite often, they do work. They achieve the desired results. But there are many situations of which mine seems a good example where one can exhaust every bit of one's intelligence, knowledge, and expertise, and understanding simply does not come. Things remain irrevocably incomprehensible, deeply mysterious. In such cases, one is confronted with a choice. Keep on struggling for an impossible comprehension or relax and accept the essential mystery. I have never seen the first option lead to anything but rage and exhaustion. And the second option, contrary to popular opinion, there is the possibility not only of peacefulness, but also of great hope. During my first chemotherapy, I was often so sick that I felt I just could not go back for more. I could have turned that into a strategic decision, either forcing myself to show up for the next treatment or accepting defeat and preparing for death. But what I found myself doing in the face of the mystery and the pain was simply to see what happened. Like a wild animal, I formulated no plans for the next day. As Wendell Berry put it, quote, I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. Like a wild human being with my natural capacities for wonderment, I was filled with expectancy. Would I show up for the next treatment or not? Most of the time, as it turns out, I did. I'm aware that this looks and sounds way too passive for most modern civilized people. From the inside though, it is anything but passive. It is alive, vibrant, dynamic, even exciting. Most of all, it is simply what nature taught me about being who I am in this world just as it is in this present moment, just as it is. I am a part of the whole situation. I do not have to perform an imaginary extraction of myself from things as they are in order to respond accurately to them. This is why I say we can never begin to heal the damage we have done to the earth until our own souls find a way back to being who they are as part of the nature we so care for. And that it is nature herself who must heal our wound and turn us toward wholeness. So much for attempting to put it into words. I have a sense now of the creator of the universe, full of exuberance, loving all things into being, bursting with cosmic delight and fashioning endlessly diverse and infinitely creative life. It is a splendor so vast that I chuckle at myself for any attempt to understand it. And now 
I must laugh aloud, for I cannot help feeling. I do understand something of it. I understand that all creation participates in creation. Created by and of the essence of an endlessly creative creator, creation creates endlessly. No wonder we sometimes can't make distinctions. Sometimes I can actually feel this creation taking place as a kind of play. Love, dancing, and freedom. Love is the pervading passion of all things that draws diversity into oneness that knows and pleads for union, that aches for goodness and beauty, that suffers loss and destruction. Love is the power that births and grieves, the laughter that fills the heavens, the tears that water the earth. Love is the energy that fuels, fills, and embraces everything everywhere, and there is no end to it ever. Love dances in freedom, which is absolute spaciousness, the inner and outer everywhere, emptiness that provides limitless growing room for love's creating, infinite elbow room for love's play, complete openness for love's experimenting. Freedom is a playground with no fences ever anywhere. Love creates and it keeps on creating and everything it creates also creates. And there is nothing but creation for even what we call destruction is creation all breakings apart precede new comings together that have never before existed and never will again we human beings are one of more than a million species of animals that share this little planet with more than another million species of plants living by the light of a small star we call the sun which is one of billions of stars in this galaxy, which is one of billions of galaxies in this universe, which is God only knows. And it's all going on in overflowing splendor, lavish profusion, luxuriant exuberance. Drum roll, somebody give me a drum roll. Last paragraph, drum roll. What the power of the slowing taught me is what the source of the all constantly yearns for. That each one of us will know without doubt that we are loved and that we are intimately, irrevocably part of the endless creation of love. And that we will join with full freedom and consciousness, the joyous creativity that is nature that is wildness, that is wilderness, that is everything. The end. The end, oh my gosh, what a great book. You know, there's something really beautiful. Um, you know, I, I, I read a lot of books out loud to various groups of people. And there's something really beautiful about reading a book together as a group, uh, it's just, you know, I mean, I, people read tons of books by themselves, but it's a different thing to go through that journey together as a group um, and constantly show up uh, to go through that journey. I think it's really a very interesting way to, to go about it. Yeah. Yeah. Any, uh, any, any last comments on the book? Now that we've read this almost 200 pages together? I'm going through um, a depression right now. It's, I go to sleep or sleep or sleep, and, but I have to go to check this. Um, it's a dark light of the soul. The soul you know, but I do believe that it's all right. I think I heard most of what you said. So this last part of the book that we read today, was it pretty meaningful for you? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Very yeah. Meaningful. Yeah, he, that last part of the book, 
uh, is very, really powerful for a lot of people because it's a different way of looking at things that are supposedly, you know, really people look at as really bad or, or whatever, but he's taking a different approach to that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's some book. I mean, it's it's um I really like that last part um where he talks about what his sons are up to, his struggle with his daughter, uh the times with his wife. Um you know, and it's an amazing thing because he wrote one of the really his book is one of the 10 books that usually people who suffer through addiction will be told to read and then it just so happens that you know his daughter struggles with addiction and he's he's one of the counselors and one of the writers who's known for his wisdom on addiction and it just shows you that you never know um you know because here he wrote one of the great books and then his daughter um he doesn't he can't you know help her and as a as a person he had to let you know let that go a little bit any other thoughts anybody would like to share oh Yeah, when I was reading it, I was I was definitely um, getting deeply touched while I was reading. Deep, it was deep. <laughs> I was thinking of his uh, of when he was going through the cancer treatments. And it's true, they use that expression so much. They're battling cancer, they're fighting cancer. Yeah. And he didn't fight, but neither did he give in. Mm -hmm. I just thought that was really interesting. Yeah, that's that's a great point. That's what he says. Don't don't think that this means that I gave up, right? Like it took it was about vitality and stuff, but it's a different way. There's a I live in Richmond right now. We're actually moving on Thursday, but um there's a huge billboard um to get onto the major highway here and there's like an 8-year-old kid and he's in like body armor, making him look like a superhero. And he says, I'm fighting cancer with my superhero powers, you know? And it's interesting because every time I pass by that, I do think of this book. Um, and I think that this is the way that we're portrayed to, to, to fight against disease. But, and I'm not saying like, like he said, he's not saying that that's wrong, but it didn't work for him. And, and there is another way, but we're usually not taught about that way or, or being given that way. So I think this book just opens another way. It doesn't, it doesn't say the, you know, that that fighting cancer thing is wrong, but like he says, it just wouldn't have worked for him at that point in his life. And I think that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. In, in some ways he did fight it. He just, I mean, he, he took part in all the chemo. I mean, isn't that fighting? 
I mean, if he wasn't fighting it, why would he subject himself to all the treatments that were so devastating? Well, does it have to be fighting it or could it be, you know, engaging with it deeply, you know, like without the warfare? Like, like the difference between maybe engaging in warfare versus very deep peace talks, but you still have to engage in some things that aren't comfortable even in peace talks. Okay. Maybe, I'm not saying I'm right, but even peace talks can be uncomfortable sometimes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> To get to peace, you know, a lot of times people have to finagle compromise. different compromise. Yeah, exactly. So maybe that was a comp, you know, a compromise that he made in this, you know, not battling, but still engaging with it. Maybe. His writing was beautiful. I mean, it was funny. It was um, descriptive. Uh, moving all of those things yeah I, and i think you're right like if you're gonna write a really it. deep if you're gonna write a really deep book you need to have some humor in there. yeah because it's tough to just have 200 pages of depth um talking about some serious things without cracking people up every once in a while i mean you really have to do that to make sure they want to continue going on the ride and i agree with you denise that i felt like there was always just enough humor in there um, to lighten the mood to keep you on the deep journey. Shit on a stick. <laughs> Shit on a stick. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just want to tell you that where I grew up, it was not crappies, but crappies. The oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think to go along with shit on the stick, it should be crappy. You know, but, you know. <laughs> should we talk a little bit about what we're reading next? It is a type of fish. It just sounds such a weird name. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like, I guess they call them panfish, like crappies, bluegills, um, perch, because um, they fit in a pan. But uh, sure. Yeah. So I think it's what, uh, the first week of August, right, Alan? Yeah, August 4th. August 4th. So our next book will be The Alchemist, which I have read many times on my own, but I've also read a couple times with groups like you all. And it's been a wildly popular book. Um, some of the reasons, and I just actually had somebody who's in one of my spiritual formation group that I, that I lead read it and changed his life. Um, he's 27. He actually went on a totally different avenue in life after he read the book which was really cool to see um so author? yeah the alchemist was written by paulo coelho who is a brazilian author um i think it's been translated into like i don't know some crazy thing like 150 different languages or something it's a hugely popular book but why i like it is because it's about a shepherd boy um from andalusia spain and he has some dreams as he's a shepherd that take him on this adventure. And you really see him grow and mature and change. And, um, you know, he meets a lot of interesting characters and it brings you to different places in the world. So it's a good book to read together because you kind of travel um, with this shepherd boy into all these new experiences as he's pursuing kind of, you know, his calling or his inner vision um, of his life. So. It's cool because you journey around with him, you meet some great characters, um, and it's a fun read too, so. Yeah, it's a good one. It's about two, it's about the same length as this one, I think, just right about 200 pages, so. Go at the, about the same speed that we went at with this book. So what time are we going to convene? Is Alan still there? I'm still here. I was just opening the door for people. Oh. I think I think the the the, 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 the it'll be from midnight to one a.m. Uh, if I'm correct. <laughs> <laughs> well, any other questions or comments before we finish? No, but Alan, what what time is it going to be? Oh, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know what you know what no no uh, I think I it's um, two p.m. your time. I think so. I think oh, you're right. Yeah. And who knows what, where you're ending up, whatever the time is there. So <laughs> That's right. I'll be in many different time zones over the next four or five months. So um, 
But yeah, 2 p.m. your time, which is, uh, that's kind of a nice two to three mid-afternoon reading, that kind of a nice time, so. Yeah, I think so. Good. Yeah. All right. Good time. Are you going to read to us? I will read to you, yes, yeah. Oh, you mean the, the Alchemist? Yeah, no, no, your book. You were going to read to us this morning. Oh, well, I didn't think, I, I thought this was gonna take much less time, but it took almost the whole hour. But I, I'll, I'll, I'll read you something quick if you want, but otherwise. Yeah, go for it. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, okay, so this is a, a book that's under my pen name, which is Jake Paida, but it's called Blue Collar Nomad. And it's a collection of uh, essays that I had published in different magazines and journals. But I will just read you, um, <laughs> I'll read you a piece that's called, um, it's called Get Out of Town Clowns. And um, I always think it's pretty funny because me and my friend Steve, he's from New Jersey, I'm from New Jersey. We were driving cross country and back in a 1979 Ford Fairmont station wagon. Um, with a red velour interior, very classy automobile. <laughs> and uh, it was packed to, the gills, packed to the gills with camping, um, art supplies, you know, you name it. And um, we pulled into a gas station in Butte, Montana. And um, well, I'll read you the piece. It's not too long. It's only about um, five pages. So it'll probably take me 15 minutes to read. Is that okay? Okay, not going anywhere. Sure. Okay. Read fast. So, but I, but I need, I need audience participation. So when I point at you all, I need you to yell at me, get out of town, clowns. All right. Okay. okay. So when I point at you, you're going to say that to me. I love reading this it, it, to groups because uh, it's pretty funny. All right. I'm trying to find where I want to start so it's not too long. Um, this country makes me feel small, Steve said in a voice that seemed too unsure for him. I think I'd rather be back in that apartment in Portland or in that cafe on the corner drinking strong coffee. Believe me, I responded, the first time I drove across America, I got pretty anxious about being immersed in all this emptiness. I don't mean America, Jake. I mean Montana. Mm. It's a lot different than New Jersey out here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is, I replied. I looked over at Steve because there had been a sense of isolation and uneasiness in the way he had spoken those last few phrases. He was a gritty surf punk who grew up thrashing waves on his shortboard along the Jersey shore. I had met him in college down in Florida where we took to each other like long lost brothers the moment we were introduced. Steve smoked a ton of cigarettes and at times could seem jittery to the untrained eye. But as a poet and a fellow Jersey boy, I saw through that superficial movement to the steely depth in his concentrated green eyes. Thus the sound of listlessness in his voice struck me as we headed east through the big sky territory. We drove in silence for the next half hour or so until the gas tank of my 1979 Ford Fairmont station wagon read near empty and I pulled off of the interstate to find a filling station in a place named Butte. There happened to be a service station with a little convenience store attached to it less than a quarter mile from the exit. As I filled the tank with gas, Steve went inside to use the restroom and purchase a cup of coffee. When he came back outside, there were two girls who seemed to be around 18 or 19 years old in tow behind him. For some reason, I thought these girls were going to be trouble. Steve and I were both in our early 20s. He had short bleached blonde hair that was almost white and sported a nose ring, while I had a full of long blonde hair that extended to my mid back. Oh my gosh. You could say that we looked a little bit out of place standing there next to an old beat up station wagon packed to the gills with camping equipment, dirty clothes and art supplies parked at a gas station in Montana. Mm -hmm. Did you fill her up, Steve asked? Yeah, I replied but I see you've picked up a couple of sand sharks in your wake. Oh. Steve turned around as the girls were almost to the car and then looked at me and said, well, they started talking to me when I asked for the coffee. They're interested in our trip. 
what we're doing all the way out here. So what are you two guys doing out here? The shorter of the two girls asked after overhearing our conversation. We're on a nomadic expedition, I answered. You got fishing gear in there? The taller girl asked while looking over at our vehicle. There's no fishing gear in there, but a lot of art supplies, Steve responded. Well, we don't have a lot of artists around here, but a lot of people in Montana like to hunt and fish, the shorter girl said. I'm sure the fishing out here must be really good, I stated, but we're just passing through on our way back across the country. That's a shame because we could use a couple guys like you around here to liven things up, the taller girl said. <laughs> yeah, you should stay a while, the shorter girl added with a mischievous giggle. It was right around this time that I noticed a guy who was about the same age as the girls poke his head out of the gas station store. His eyes met mine from across the parking lot. And the only thing in his eyes was hostility for the two strangers talking to the two local girls. I tried to get Steve's attention, but after only having me to talk with for days on end, these girls had waylaid his attention. Maybe it was because I had traveled a lot more than Steve, but my nomad senses were tingling, telling me to get the heck out of there. After listening to Steve and the local girls have a half-witted conversation for about 10 minutes, with Steve trying to lecture earnestly about art, but the girls spouting ridiculous innuendo that could not possibly ever come to fruition, I noticed what seemed like a parade of jacked up pickup trucks pulling into the parking lot. It was like watching a pack of steelhead trout with bad intentions streaming into a shallow pool in order to feast on a couple of minstrel male water skippers who for some strange reason were trying to mate with some homegrown female crawdads. <laughs> the next thing I knew our station wagon was surrounded. The two girls looked at the trucks and then at each other and almost simultaneously blurted out, oh shit before they walked quickly away from us and back into the safety of the convenience store. Then Steve turned to look at me and I saw in his eyes that he now realized the rapid gravity of the situation. What I think confounded us the most was how quickly this mob of monster trucks and their teamsters had assembled before us. At least with a shark, when you were surfing, you got some warning as a fellow surfer would invariably yell out, "Hey!" There's a guy in a gray flannel shoot over there. So for some reason, you call a shark a guy in a gray flannel suit when you're out surfing. I don't know why that is, but that's what you, that's what you do. For a while, Steve and I just stood there, peering out at the glaring assembly, waiting for someone from their party to make a move. We were close enough to the gas pumps that I figured they wouldn't try to run us over or shoot at us. However, it was Montana, and almost all the trucks had gun racks with rifles stationed upon them. Eventually, the door of the largest monster truck opened, and a short, scrawny guy about our age jumped down from his mammoth machine perch. I looked over at Steve, and we both had to try to keep from laughing, as the Napoleon-like figure barely kept his feet after making the jump. The guy wore baggy black jeans, and a tank top that had the word insane printed on it. He sported a buzz cut that made him look like a white supremacist. We would later learn that Butte was in fact the home to many white supremacists. Yeah. He strode toward us with a pompous, lethargic manner. His gait was no accident, but was made to deliver a message to us. And that message was, this is our territory. Finally, he completed his saunter over to us and when I say over to us, I mean that he stood with his nose pressed into my Adam's apple. <laughs> Again, this was a deliberate move to show us that he had absolutely no fear because this was his place. What happened next will always live on in my memory for its sheer veracity and simplicity. The guy cocked his head upward, stared straight into my eyes and addressed the both of us when he said, Get out of town, you bums. I remember feeling as if everything else in the world, the cars and tractor trailers careening by on the interstate, 
the other local shaved head nails and their girlfriends who had stepped out of their monster trucks and assembled around us. The crows sitting on the telephone wires had all frozen as Montana's modern version of Napoleon uttered that perfect locational message to us. The guy then repositioned his head so that his nose once again poked into my Adam's apple for the next two minutes or so. The only sound I heard during this time was a crow's wings flapping overhead as it left its perch along the wires and flew off into the western horizon, which was now a tad darker blue than when we had arrived and was infused with light orange and red strokes of color as the sun began to finalize its descent into the deep, vast salt water that ebbed and flowed beyond the mountains and desert far to our left. At this point, I managed to glance over at Steve, who was inwardly fuming, and who I guessed was about 10 seconds away from unhinging the gasoline hose from its compartment, spraying the guy with said liquid, and then throwing his lit cigarette onto him. This, however, would not have been a good decision. So I gathered up all the yin energy I had stored up from our time visiting the West Coast and said to our new diminutive acquaintance and anyone else who would listen, well then, I think we'll be on our way. I moved away from the guy and shoved Steve towards the passenger side front door. Then I walked around the interior of the car over to the driver's side, opened the door, looked around one last time to appreciate that all of the eyes of the local posse were still burned into me, got inside, inserted the key into the ignition and turned it. As we drove out of the gas station parking lot, a caravan of monster trucks began to appear behind our station wagon. This caravan followed us back out onto the interstate and stayed with us until the next exit, which was positioned at the Butte city limits. There, the trucks all turned off the interstate like one long curling fly fishing line heading towards an eddy as Steve and I sped into the hazy eastern horizon, 2,000 miles away from the familiarity and security of the polluted waves that we grew up on. Very good. I love that story. Get out of town, clowns. He actually said that to us. It's a perfect phrase. I just love it. I like that it's PG. It's nice and clean. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, I will see you all hopefully uh, in August and wish you all a blessed time until then. All right. All right. Thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of your summer and your travels. Thank you. All right. Take care, everyone. Take care. Yeah.